Okay. because I'm hoping and praying, a lot of us have been praying and hoping uh, for a few months now, that this would be a catalytic moment for you to engage the spirit, to engage scripture, to engage community and figuring out what it means for you to live into the diversity of our city and ultimately the kingdom of God. So if you were in church this morning, you um, met my friend Ron. Dr. Franklin is his name, but I would never call him that. Right? Um, he uh, and I met each other, I said earlier 15 years, but I think it's more like 12, right? Um, and uh, he and I have kept in contact after I left Northwestern College. He was a counselor at Northwestern College and um, super grateful for uh, the way that Ron is a husband, is a father, is a friend, um, is a brother, um, and is a way that he thinks and writes and talks about organizations and churches, um, not just loving your neighbor from a distance, because we can all love our neighbor who is on the other side of the city, but really embracing our neighbor and inviting them around tables to share a meal, to share conversation, even if we disagree, right? Because we're not all gonna agree with the things that we'll be discussing today, and that's okay. Um, something that Ron will talk about is how do we be different, but also owning who we are as who God created us to be. So I'm just super excited about Ron. Uh, just again, um, beverages are in the back in the cooler and at the bar. There's restrooms in the back. Um, dinner will be around five o'clock. So Ron will pray for us in a good spot, but we're also going to be moving around too. Um, so if you would like a mask, we have masks for you as we're moving around doing a game. Um, but masks are also optional too. So about while you're sitting down. So. 
without further ado, I'll just pass it off to Dr. Franklin. <laughs> Hey, we're going to have some fun together this evening, y'all. I am pleased to be here with you, uh, not only because it's a gift to see my brother, Ben, but if y'all are family to Ben, then by extension, you are a family to me. And so this feels a bit humorous, like a bit of a reunion. Hey. We're going to bar. We're going to talk about connecting across cultures. So i got to tell you really playfully, my family grew up with no alcohol in our house, and then I came to West Michigan. <laughs> it's like I found out, right, that this is what we do in this space. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk through this evening is what does it look like to connect and work effectively across cultures, right? The beverage reference is really playful um, and often has very little significance. But what we're going to work through is what perhaps does that mean for you all as members of churches, as leaders of organizations, in your church and et cetera, how do we in fact work well across different? And that'll be a burning question that I hope you continue to wrestle with in our time together today. The other thing you might be entertained with is I'm going to hold the microphone and try to use a clicker and not trip over the cord. If it happens, you can laugh. Uh, I hope that our time together is full of both learning and, uh, and fun. Uh, so I, I think those two things can function together. But at the end of the day, y'all, I think this is also about kingdom work. Uh, my conversations with Ben and others throughout my history have led me to land on this idea that with diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is both about the optics in the sense of how we look, but it's also about operations. And I wonder if we can get ourselves to a space where we are operating in such a way that the optics come more naturally. Right? Often we think about it the other way around. We want to do the operational stuff last, and we just want to look really good in the sense of having the kingdom amongst us. But I'm a bit of an Iowa boy. I'm not, not actually from Iowa, but I spent the majority of my life there recently. And one of the things I picked up in Iowa is that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> yeah? I don't know who they might be for you in your community or your church, but I think if we work on building it, they will come. So today we're going to work on building our capacities so that whoever lands in our spaces as our brothers and sisters, both in or outside of the faith, can feel like they both belong and that they're dignified. And we can talk about theologically why that might matter. And I think if we do that well, then God will be glorified. All right. So a little bit of intro for you. We'll see if everything's working well. Uh, what we know about our world is as it is increasing in numbers, our proximity to each other is also shrinking. So thanks to social media and et cetera, right there are abilities for us to connect with people who come from places and perspectives that are very different than our own. So we're connecting and working across borders, perhaps internationally, doing the same perhaps at home in our own neighborhoods, right, as we recognize that demographics are changing. Uh, I was quite intrigued that West uh, Michigan in particular, I think Holla, Ben and I were entertained by this idea that 25%, a quarter of your population is now Hispanic Latino. A quarter wasn't the case a decade ago, right? And then within our organizations, right, what does it look like for us to connect with the youth pastor and the worship leader and the person who just walked in off the street? Right, how do we do those organizational functions well, but then also thinking about the span of generations that are existing in our worship spaces as well. This is often something that we don't talk about much, but my friends, this is the broadest spread of generational differences that have ever existed in the world. So we got, playfully, some really old folks and we got some really young folks all going to church together trying to follow Jesus. And some of us enjoy dial-up internet and others are on TikTok, right? It's a vast span of cultures related to generations. Really quickly, uh, what does it mean to be a multi-ethnic church? Right? It would suggest that uh, there's no single ethnic group that makes up more than 80% of your church population. And we know that community schools, workplaces, and et cetera are experiencing record levels of diversity. This is just a business reference point. I don't know how many of y'all have women in leadership in the spaces that you occupy but the number of Fortune 500s led by women 
um, is just above that led by men named John. <laughs> Fascinating, right? And then 88% uh, of evangelical Protestant churches are what we would say not multi-ethnic. It's like 12%, right? Of churches. So what I want to suggest to you really simply is that culture matters. Okay? And I want to show you how it matters for me. So this is little Ron. Uh, I don't know, can you find me? On the, if somebody finds me, can you, can you see me up there? Just guess, call out what number I'm, I'm wearing. Yeah, that's a good guess, and that is me. Humorously, I think I saw a couple people um, wearing some pretty nice shoes these days. And uh, do you see mine? Those are most certainly running shoes, Adidas, and I was wearing them for basketball. So that just gives you a little snapshot of where I was coming from socioeconomically, right? Um, I was not at all wealthy, and now I'm standing in front of you wearing a pair of Jordans that I would never have been able to purchase in my youth. But more importantly, the differences in my teammates is what started to spark for me the interest in cultural intelligence, right? As a team, you're trying to come together and be successful in accomplishing a goal like winning a game. And I had to figure that out with dudes who actually were coming from all over the world. So we have people from Ghana, from uh, parts of Africa that actually surprised me, South Sudan, my buddy Dal Jock, uh, who's on the far right, he ended up playing at Oklahoma and had a really special career. Uh, but he taught me so many things I'll never forget, eating okra soup in his mom's kitchen, but sitting on the floor and doing so. But the hospitality that I experienced in that place changed my life, right? And then, yeah, there's another little friend of mine. Uh, his name is Brian. He's not from Mexico. He has Irish roots. You can probably find him by the color of his hair, yeah. These are good friends of mine. And then I came to Northwest Iowa soon after that. And I'm going to do this a couple times just for effect. <laughs> See what's happening, right? So I went from being full of what I would call diversity to what I thought then was people from all over Iowa. I, almost all of my teammates were from Iowa when I came to college to play basketball. And uh, can you find me? I'm like in the same spot. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but shoes, right? How humorous. My shoes were different, though. But these, these folks help me understand that diversity is beyond what we would see in terms of one's race and ethnicity. Right? Some of these guys were goat farmers, some of them had cattle, some of them worked on dairies, others thought that sloppy joe should be called maid rights or loose meat sandwiches. Do y'all argue over stuff like that here? No? Yeah. Sauces. Sauces are important. Um, but this is my family, right? So as I land in Northwest Iowa, then I fall in love with this girl who I thought knew nothing about life and how it was to function in a space that was really unfamiliar, or familiar to me, but unfamiliar to her, right? I tried to bring her to Kansas City and I, I didn't know what that was gonna be like. But the way in which her family welcomed me in, actually in a space similar to this, I pop up at the barn and everybody's brought their salads, right? Like, <laughs> apple slices and whipped cream, and, right? This was their family reunion of sorts, right? Um, but I was welcomed into that space, but I was also allowed to be myself nonetheless. Uh, and so there's other stories about my wife and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll tap into them later, but uh, here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna explore what cultural intelligence is, and I, yeah, we'll get to tell you some cool other stuff about it, but another important piece is actually defining culture and what it means more theoretically, and then we can talk about it practically. Then we're gonna to try to develop our CQ. We're gonna look at some application and do some Q&A. So Ben and I, at the end of this, would just love to open the floor up and let you ask whatever questions are on your heart and your mind. Cultural intelligence is what I might call a uh, partial solution to a larger quest that we are on. So I don't want to suggest to you that it is an end-all, be-all, and it will be the silver bullet to this challenge moving forward and connecting across difference, but it's a piece of the puzzle. And then lastly, we'll talk about future plans and development like what's happening at the boulevard and perhaps how you might be engaged with developing your CQ into the future. But here's the question that I'd love to ask you on how you wrestle with not only when we're here today but as you transition. What is the difference between churches that serve successfully in today's globalized multicultural world and perhaps those that fail? And I want to suggest to you that CQ has an important role to play. What is cultural intelligence? You have a piece of paper in front of you. If you 
flip it over, it should have four squares and it gives you a brief definition of cultural intelligence. But it is the capability or capacity to function effectively in spaces characterized by a cultural difference. That is CQ, and that's what we'll work our way through today. There's four factors, drive, knowledge, strategy, and action. We'll talk our way through what each of those means subsequently through our time together. But I want you to have a chance to get to know the people who you've come here with. And specifically, here's what I would like you to do. I want you to share your name and your church or where you've come from, why cultural intelligence might be a value to you, your people, the places that you occupy, and then lastly, what do you hope to get out of this workshop? So we're going to give you uh, about eight minutes, that should be about two minutes per person or so, uh, to reflect on those questions. And then what's going to happen, I'm going to pull you together. And we're going to try to identify perhaps some thematic hopes that we are sharing this time together. All right? We'll see you in about eight minutes.
not halfway done, try to speed it up. got about one more minute. If you can get to your last few folks and make sure they have a chance to share, you have about a minute remaining. such a way that we can find a way to identify a few thematic hopes and then as those hopes are being scribed I want us to try to identify a couple of ways to help make those hopes become real so what I mean to say by that is what is it that we are going to expect from each other in terms of being able to create a space where we can facilitate openness and authenticity and etc but I, I would love for that to come from you because what you identify as what you're after and how we're going to get there is going to help make it happen. Okay? So, um, we just got started. We've been here for about 30 minutes together. But my hope is that if I ask you a question, you can just raise your hand or speak really loudly. And if I can't hear you, we'll find a way to relay the message and get it out. Okay? So, what did you talk about at your time for our time together tonight? This is like that class participation moment. Well, with the question, Ron, I know that you guys are asking. Of course I am, Kate. Uh, what are your hopes that were discussed at your table that maybe we can all share together? That makes sense. We want to get better to make the world better for future generations. Yeah, thank you. Others, 
Yeah. Create space. Say more. Create space. Create space where we can uh, potentially learn more about each other and not be overprogrammed. You mean you don't want me to talk to you for three hours? <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Others? We talked a lot about uh, like practical action, so hoping for some, I don't know, tips for lack of a better word, but also kind of ties into what you said. You really stuck with me about uh, working on the operations within optics follow. Um, I think that is really important. Thanks. Maybe one more? transition to ground rules, I would love to hear from you, maybe even just three. It isn't to suggest that those are the only three, but what might be three things that we could use together to guide our time together as ground rules? What, what would you all like to commit ourselves to so that we can make these hopes a reality? the world and future generations better, uh, creating space where you don't have to listen to a person lecture to you the entire time, namely Dr. Ron Franklin, and tell you. we won't do that, okay? Uh, so I should share with you, part of this experience is going to be what you put into it, all right? So I have a ton of stuff that I could talk to you about, but for it to be transformational, you have to find a way to live into it and talk about it and make it real and relevant for yourself, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. And then next, uh, owning our biases. Right? So a really important first step is to acknowledge who you are and where you are and what has made you to be such. Right? So if I'm trying to go and connect with other people who might be different than myself, if I don't even understand myself really well, it's going to be all the more challenging to connect with someone who is different than myself. And we'll talk about that as we lean into CQ Drive. Ground rules, uh, don't be a picture with two circles and a protrusion. Uh, don't get it. Assume the best, and then uh, encouragement to have no fear. I think if we make those things happen, y'all are going to get what you needed out of this time again. Shall we? All right. Let's go. Um, there's a lot of people who use CQ. I won't talk through what all of them are doing and how they are using CQ, but uh, it's quite impressive. And so for me as a researcher, what I was looking for is perhaps the best way to help develop people's capacity and one that is not uh, 
pigeonholing or suggesting that you are the way you are and there's no way to get better. Right? The cultural intelligence framework is what we might call a multiple loci framework, which means it has more than one means by which we understand what the big picture is all about. Right? So there's drive, knowledge, strategy, and action. All four of those are essential for us to understand what cultural intelligence is in terms of our capacity to function effectively across differences. And it's measurable and it's malleable. The measurable piece is like you can take a survey and get a specific score that tells you how you compare to the entire world who has participated in this survey experience. We're not doing that today. But the malleable piece is certainly what we will work our way through today. So wherever you are in terms of your level of cultural intelligence, I like to encourage people that if you are like at the bottom of the barrel and you are really terrible in terms of connecting across cultures, there's good news for you. You can get better. And if you've lived all over the world with people from all over the place and uh, you've traveled and done missions work and you've got some really high CQ levels maybe, I got good news for you too. You, in fact, can get better. My friends, there's over 500 variable cultures that exist that have been identified in the world that God has created. And for sure, none of us in this room have the ability to understand and function alongside all of those people at a really high level. If you are, come and teach me, please, because i got some learning to do. So we can all improve, and that's what I want you to understand about our time again today. Uh, here's why folks are using CQ, because, uh, of course, there's diverse markets to tap into. There's a uh, multicultural workforce that's increasing. We would love to retract, uh, excuse me, attack, wow, attract and retaining top talent, all right? And then there's some financial benefits, all right? Uh, but I want to pause here really quickly uh, and maybe ask you, what might be a reason that people of faith would love to engage in developing their cultural intelligence? Pastors, you can't talk. No, I'm just kidding. What, what might be a reason? Because the Bible says, go into all the world. And how can I go into all the world unless I can connect with in some way and relate to people? And all the world, like you said earlier, the world is here. You know, there used to be a time when, you know, this and that would go on missions, but guess what? We're people on a mission here. Mm -hmm. And I would love to be able to understand more the world that's right here. Yeah, so we live in the already but the not yet, right? What does it look like for us to have and build those capacities where that kingdom comes and that will is being done on earth as it is? Thank you. Paul talks a lot about this. You can ask your pastor to preach about it soon. Um, but I think it's important for us to think about what our faith looks like lived out in the real world. But does culture matter? All right, uh, I'm done talking to you. I'm going to let you play a game. So on your tables, there's a couple of half sheets buried. It should be in the middle of your table. And here's what's happening here in this space. There is a big party that's going to be thrown. And culture A, you are the host of said party. Culture A, you are the host of said party. Culture B, if you have a culture B, Slip. You and a few folks are going to slip outside and enjoy the sun while you practice embodying the cultural expectations that are scripted for you on paper. Okay, but here's what I uh, would love to see you do. Treat these expectations as, as if they are the most important rules that your mother and father ever taught you. Okay? And when you enter into the party, I want you to have as much fun as possible while still maintaining those expectations that are scripted out for you for your culture. Okay? So, if you are culture B, if you could stand up, we will transition to the left, go right. You can follow Kevin.
So we might even be able to find a way to play some music in here. Y'all want to identify some spaces and maybe develop some tactics about how you might accomplish said goals. Okay? But culture A, this is, this is your space. You're throwing the party. Got him? So let me give you the cheat, cheat sheet, because we needed the cheat sheet when the staff did this earlier. Um, so basically, you're doing a couple things. You're making eye contact. You're laughing and trying to make them laugh. You're touch, physical touch, appropriately touching them, like on the shoulder or the hand. Um, and then uh, you, you, uh, it's important to interact with your own gender. Um, and then uh, red is an indicator of interaction. Blue is where first meeting should take place. So you're going to really want to try to force them. You know, so when uh, we gathered about 15 pastors, and, and we did this with the 15 pastors, first of all, pastors are no fun. Like, so let's, let's have fun. And then, uh, but like, you really like want to, one pastor said, it felt like I was Mexican and he wanted me to go to where the fajitas were, and like he felt really uncomfortable, right? And so that's what we're really going to try to do. We're really going to try to push the people to the cultural moments. So you're going to really try to push them to, um, wait, if someone, if someone is red area without first being, so you really want to push them to blue first and then push them to red. And then just notice the interactions. Notice the interactions when, go ahead. Question, question. Oh, so, yes, red and blue. Yes, red yes. And blue. Oh so there's, there's a couple of squares along the way, but you also have an entirely red wall, which was perfectly planned for me when I decided to host this activity. <laughs> Very <laughs> much planned. But you have an entire red wall. So just read through, read through this a couple times. I promise you it's a lot easier than uh, it looks. Just read through this a couple times. Not yet. I think they need more time. I think. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, 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 I think Ron just needs to put it closer to his mouth.
the eye to so you guys pay attention. It's actually, you know, for me, I, I have a bit of ADD. And so if I'm not directly focused on someone, I get confused and it's like all the other conversations and stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. together to explore the last one just before it's time to eat.
in the ways in which you're exploring life across difference, but then maybe especially for people who perhaps are entering into our spaces of worship, and that space is not quite home for them, right? So that's the question then at the bottom of the page, right, is to ask how might this relate to our lives together as people of faith and uh, those who are attempting to share the love of God with folks perhaps who are not like ourselves. So what do you talk about? Or perhaps maybe let's skip that piece. Not what you talk about. Let's talk about it together right now. What does it have to do with our real lives? Anybody, the floor is wide open. A realization perhaps that occurred to you as we were together playing this game and how it relates to real life. Yeah. Easy, easy to give up, but realizing we should do more than just quit. Yeah, thank you. What else? Yeah. You can get uncomfortable really quickly mm -hmm. if you don't know the other person's culture or norm, um, or if they don't know yours. It's just, it's really easy to feel out of place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's easy to get uncomfortable or feel out of place. Yeah. Anything else would occur? Yeah. He forced me to focus on only my agenda. Yeah. Like, and I didn't care at all what other people were doing. <laughs> I gotta get under there, I gotta do this, and it was just about my agenda. Mm -hmm. And, and it, yeah, it actually made me uncomfortable how often that felt like it was Sunday morning to me. Mm -hmm. Like, half the time Sunday morning, I was like, how do I get these people to that place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So I was exposed to a book called of, uh, friendship at the margins that uh, reflected on this idea actually of unlearning speed for the sake of mutuality. Right? We get so focused on our rules, and of course, thank you for buying in because I told you and asked you to do that, right? And you locked in and you made, made it happen. And maybe we do that more often than we'd like to admit. Yeah. I can add, y'all, at any point, if anything that we do is uh, pushing you beyond an appropriate level of anxiety, right? Because there is an appropriate balance, I think. If we are to grow, we must stretch ourselves, and to stretch ourselves, sometimes we have to be uncomfortable. But if it reaches a level that you are not comfortable, you have the freedom to, I mean, you can step away, okay? Uh, so, thank you for reminding me that kind of counselor in my head. Um, but yes, you have the freedom to choose uh, how, how deep you do engage. Yeah, the reflection for you? Um, kind of coming also from the other aspect, I tend to be the one who is very, very, you know, eye contact and touch feel it. And for me, it's learning how, how my behavior, you know, oh my goodness, you know, I need to remember that there are those people and how to engage them. Mm -hmm. I turned back twice. Mm -hmm. 
and when I got there, I don't know where the gentleman is, but um, when I got in the door, he was just very welcoming and around mm -hmm. us. Ben prayed over me, and I was like, I'm going to be serious. Like, I'm going to cry. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, it was just, it, it, we need God. We need God. I mean, and so, we need to talk about That's right. That's right. Yeah, it made me think about that. Because I, not that, you know, I could never love, but it just made me think harder. Like, Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I like okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good, y'all. Hey, so I want to tell you really quickly, thank you. Um, and I hope that that experience will spark the future of our conversation for the rest of the evening. Two things really quickly. I'm going to give you a definition of culture that we perhaps can function with as we move forward. And then we're going to pray over food and y'all are going to dive into your book. All right. So uh, culture is so amorphous that it's really hard to grasp or define. But in some ways, this is the best framing that we have. Sociologists, and I think, do we have one in the room? Yeah? We're trying to do the best they can to identify what culture is, and here's what we have. A shared pattern of beliefs, values, behaviors, and assumptions that distinguish a group from another pattern of beliefs, ideas, behaviors, and assumptions that distinguish one group from another. And I like to think more practically, right? You got that big t It's how we do things around here. So as you get ready to transition to lunch, here's what I heard. Wow, it is nighttime. Do you call it dinner or supper here? Dinner. Dinner. My people. No, I'm just kidding. Supper's fine too. Uh, but here's what I want you to be thinking about as you eat. These three questions. Uh, first, an identification. What are three cultural groups that you identify with? So again, a shared set of ideas, beliefs, behaviors, and assumptions that differentiate you from some other group in the world. And then secondly, why do you identify with that group or those groups? And then lastly, what do they say about you? Who you are, if someone sees you and knows you are a part of that group, what's the connection point that one might have to who you are and what you represent? Okay? Think about those three things. We're going to bless the food here quickly, and then uh, we're going to eat some good food. Join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you have done and what you will continue to do, not only in our lives, but the lives of our neighbors. Thank you for your love, and we thank you for the care and opportunity that you have given us to enjoy in this fellowship with you. We ask that you bless the food, the hands that prepared, and everything that was uh, given to us for us to be able to enjoy it right now. Your name we pray. Amen. So we'll start from back here. The uh, first uh, tables want to go and eat. There was about 50 or so people that paid, um, but after y'all go through, if there's more food, I mean, everybody should eat if there's more food. So I kind of just needed to know how many people we could pay for. So uh, we'll just start from here. If you pay for food, go on up. Um, but I'm assuming we have leftovers. So if you came and you didn't pay, that's okay. Y'all just are going to get some food. Right? <laughs>
Okay, can we get uh, the next, uh, we'll just start right here from uh, Luna table to Zwerin table. Y'all can go get you. Y'all are on our space, so. The next group. The next group. If you don't have food, go get your food. If you don't have food, go get food. Go get
everybody. If you haven't gotten your food yet, or if you haven't gotten seconds, please do so. Um, bathroom break, beverage break, uh, whatever you need. We're going to start in five minutes, okay? Five minutes. And please get seconds. Don't be shy. Oh,
All right, my friends, we are going to dive back in. I hope your meal is incredible. So we're gonna we're gonna get rolling. We got a, a lot to cover and not a ton of not a ton of time. But I want to transition us now to the CQ framework. Should I do like the school, the school approach? Like if you can hear me clap once. 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 We got some music in the house. Ah, good, 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 appreciate it. Okay, y'all, welcome back, welcome back. I hope your meal was incredible. Um, and I hope we can be fed a little further as we keep uh, leaning in here. I want to get you into the cultural intelligence framework. And uh, we're going to talk about how to develop our capacity, right, in our drive, knowledge, strategy, and action. Uh, so I got a little hint from a birdie in the back of the room, you know, that there's this itch. Like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, tell me. Step A, B, C, and D. I can encourage you that, yes, we will get there, uh, but you will not arrive. Okay? We will get there, but you will not arrive. I'd love to think that I'm skilled enough to get you there right now, but I'm sorry, y'all, it's not gonna happen. Uh, all of this is about a lifestyle, not simply a workshop that will solve all of our ills in the world. But encouragement, we do the best we can with what we have right where we are, and you are here. And that's a beautiful thing to see. So thanks for joining in this journey that will be uh, yeah, bringing us together for the time being, and hopefully, long after I take off. But to lean in uh, to the CQ drive in particular, right, you've got your little cheat sheet in front of you. This is essentially a motivational component, and it is made up of three aspects or three sub-dimensions. So once drive involves your intrinsic motivation and interest, it also entails one's extrinsic motivations and interests, and then also a sense of self-efficacy. So one of the things I really appreciate about the game that we get to play is that you tap into each of those in that short window of an experience, right? You had to decide how intrinsically motivated you were to participate in that activity. And then there's also this element of external pressure, let's say perhaps me as the authority guiding the activity, and I, I asked you to do such, right? Um, and then there's this other sense of one's self-efficacy, like how good do you think you are at doing cross-cultural life, mm -hmm. right? All of those factors play into your CQ drive. But I want to give you a chance uh, at your table. There is, on the flip side of one of your pieces of paper, there's some gaps that says like CQ discussion and stuff or something like that, not the values page, can I see what you say? CQ reflections and notes. So there's a little bit of space for you to write an answer to this question that's on the screen. What is the cultural group or situation that is most challenging for you right now? And I'll tell you why we identify that, right? If motivation has something to do with our drive and our interest, intrinsic and extrinsic and our self-efficacy, it's really important actually to identify what burns us out. Okay? So what is a group, and we might say a cultural group, or perhaps a situation with another group that is stressful, taxing, draining of your energy? Who, who might that group be? I'll give you a quick example. So uh, I grew up in North Kansas City, yeah, went to a um, Methodist church, and then I landed in Northwest Iowa and went to a Lutheran church, and a uh, really quick pause moving backwards. Where I grew up, I, uh, my dad was in the band, and so I got to have communion whenever I wanted as a snack. Okay? So my dad's up drumming, and they're prepping for worship and performing in other churches and such, and I'm like getting all the blessings that I can. Great juice was amazing, the wafers, not so much. Um, but nourishing. Yeah? So then I go to this Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, I knew nothing of it, but my wife and her family went to this church. So I go there, and I sit down, and I'm ready to take communion, and I got a hand put on my leg, and it was time for our pew to get up and go. Yeah. I was told that I couldn't go take communion. 
smoke probably started fiddling from my ears, right? Um, I'm saying all of this because like, that is a group for me that is like the Samaritans, if you will, that I needed to find a way to love because surely they were doing things for a reason. I didn't know what their motivation was. But since we do uh, not in pictures, I can use not Like I was pissed off. Like who are you to tell me that I can't come to the table? But part of that was because I did not know them and their story and their history and why they functioned the way that they did. I still might contend that I would love to come to the table without, you know, some affirmation from said priest who says I can be a right? Um, but nonetheless, I was being a hater in that moment. But I got this incredible wife that you saw in the picture. She went up and did her reverent thing and uh, brought me back half of a cup and half of a wafer. And I will never forget it. The moment you know you're gonna marry somebody, right? Like, wow, this is a real one. <laughs> on top of that, that liquor. Like, I thought it was grape juice, and it hit my chest, <laughs> and it warmed me up. And that is, for me, why communion is so, so special. I will never forget that moment. So, um, nonetheless, though, parochial school, Lutheran folks, like, I am learning continually to love them. Right. So that's a cultural group that's challenging for me. So I wonder what that is for you. I want you to take a moment, write down that person, those people, and then we'll come back together um, and, and work our way through CP motivation to drive. All right, my friends, I'm gonna keep us moving here. I hope you can put a revisit it, perhaps even after we're done. Um, but I wanna to talk to you, yeah, about how we can get better regarding our speed drive, right? So here's a quick tip for you. If there is a slide to take a picture of, this might be it in relation to developing your CQ drive, right? So here's the thing, you can identify your tough cultures, right? which is something that we just did. Here's another way. You can really be intentional about understanding what it takes for you to be recharged regarding your engagement across difference, right? So if large group parties exhaust you, what perhaps will refuel you, right? And then this extrinsic piece, right, about uh, what, what might be a, a push for you to be motivated and continue to be engaged in those spaces that are challenging for you. What are the perks? All right, there's benefits. Some of us might get promotions. Some of us might get chances to travel the world. It's okay to identify what those perks might be, all right? And then lastly, <laughs> and this is the only reason that I am here, is because we are about something bigger, all right? The mission, the motivation has been scripted for us in the good book from Genesis to Revelation. What does the Imago Day really mean? An image bearer of the Most High. At what point do I get to say that you are not an image bearer? In fact, never. And then if my relationship with God means anything, then my proximity to God has something to say to my proximity to you as a fellow image bearer 
regardless of your entry into the body or not. But if you are a member of the body, all the more, right? We can preach later. I'm going to stop right there. You get the idea. Because at the end of the day, every tribe, telling nation, people will be gathered, right? Good. There's some other little tips there. Eat and socialize with people who are perhaps not like yourself. Be honest with yourself and examine your confidence level. So, at the end of the day, what is your motivation? Uh, probably can assume that your faith has something to do with that, but I would encourage you to identify what is your drive, what is your motivation to be engaged in this conversation and to be living a life of faith that helps us to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. What is your motivation? Next piece of the puzzle is CQ Knowledge. This is where most workshops of this type spend a ton of time, and we're not going to do that. Because <laughs> there's some other factors, right? Knowledge is one of four. So we're going to breeze through it really quickly. But what it's about is your awareness and understanding about how cultures are both similar and different. That's the simple way of identifying what CQ knowledge is about. How much do you understand about how cultures are similar and different? There's some subdimensions here. There's business, values and norms, sociolinguistics, and then leadership. Uh, leadership is quite fascinating to me in the sense uh, that there's some people where hierarchy is critical, right? And as it relates to one's leader, like, you don't have access to said person. You might see this in spaces like Google and Facebook where people all have the same type of uh, office setup, right? Everybody gets a cubicle. Flat level plane. But then there's other spaces where hierarchy is critical, where you don't even get to shake the hand of your leader. There's so much reverence and respect. Or like Ben did this morning, right? He introduced me as Ron, and I'm wrestling with what does it look like now to be a PhD, and when do I request or not that my name be mentioned as Dr. Ron Franklin Jr.? Because there's implications for respect that follow, right? And you have to choose, perhaps, when you want to leverage those types of relationships. But I want to talk to you really quickly about a couple of things that might be entertaining for you. Uh, on the back of your What is CQ page, there are a number of cultural values listed there for you. We are going to tap into just a couple of them. Uh, but the ones that might be most relevant for you in your church spaces, perhaps, Actually, all of them will probably show themselves at some point. But um, expressiveness is pretty intriguing to me. So what does worship look like, right? Expressive and non-expressive cultures certainly come to praise in different ways. Ben and I were entertained by this idea of hands being up or down or folded or behind your back. What posture does one express in the church space and what is welcome or not welcome. Like why do we dim the lights uh, at concert-like experiences, right? And what types of freedom does that allow people to express? I want to suggest to you that it's a continuum that's not about good or bad or better or worse. These cultural values are given to you, similar to the game that we played, right? You didn't necessarily ask for them, but it's your place of comfort, right? Our cultural values are a place of comfort. They're not deterministic or suggestive, again, of what's better or worse. But expressiveness, if we get some time later, I can tell you about my meeting of both a Brazilian and then a Russian friend and how my engagements with them were quite different and how embarrassed I was in not recognizing the necessity to switch between my expressiveness between the two of them. Really quickly, me and my Brazilian friend, quite boisterous. Me and my friend from Russia, quite stoic. And I was trying to figure out, like, how to dance between a conversation with the three of them together. Right. The next one I mentioned to you, power distance. Uh, most of the world actually functions in a hierarchical structure where high power distance is the norm. And so you might imagine, let's say, if someone comes from a different place or culture and they land in our church and pastor is there ready to shake their hand, is that comfortable or uncomfortable for perhaps our guest? Right? And then how do we facilitate that relationship in a healthy way? Then we have low context and high context. And uh, I'll 
see if I can recover this even though <laughs> the images have shifted and they make no sense for this slide. I'm not sure what happened. But <laughs> Okay, uh, so if you're, in a, if you're in a low context culture, it would be what we would call maybe more cosmopolitan, where the freedom to be different is expected. As such, your communication has to be a bit more direct to communicate what you want and what you mean, right? Uh, in a high context space, that communication might happen less because it's expected that you are able to pick up on the cues around you and understand the moment. Really quick reference for me and my family. My dad is a Marine, and he spoke to me directly about what I needed to do. Like Ron tuck in your shirt. He would be so disappointed right now. But I had to make up my bed, right, um, and make sure the corners were folded, and he told me exactly what he needed me to do. Rachel's family, on the other hand, my wife, her father would walk into the room if it was not clean, and what he would do is run his finger along uh, like the floorboards or um, anywhere that dust could be found, and he would show her, and he would leave the room. Okay? <laughs> Indirect communication versus direct communication. My, my dad would have said, boy, grab the dustpan. He would have told me, straight up. So you can imagine how fun our conversations are at home, trying to navigate direct and indirect communication as we parent our children, right? Um, so anyway, that just gives you a snapshot of direct and indirect communication. Here's what we're going to do, though. I'm going to give you a chance to live into this. I hope you can find a partner. So what we need is a person A and a person B. Person A, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. You are going to directly invite your partner to a dinner meeting tonight. Supper, if you will. Uh, but you believe their presence is crucial to secure some type of partnership, right? Person A is going to be a direct communicator. On the other hand, person B, here is your role. You have a family commitment, you can't make it, but you are to respond indirectly. Okay, so in other words, it means say no without saying no. Got it? Okay, so identify a person A at your table. If you have three people, y'all can find a way to navigate a rotation. But person A, you're going to be a direct communicator, and you need that person to come to dinner tonight. Person B, you can't go.
figure out who I might serve. And that idea landed on my plate and it never left. That you can't hate someone who's steward you know. Okay. Next, understand different languages, perhaps, right? Uh, some of you can speak multiple, others maybe not so much, but the value of language is important to recognize that even jokes are communicated differently. Like, what do people find funny? It varies across cultures. Next, reviewing the basic cultural system. So you got a little cheat sheet there, the cultural values page, right? That runs you through 10 of some of the most identifiable cultural value differences that exist in our world. There are certainly more, but that's a framework for you to be working through. And then lastly, learn about those cultural values, right? What differentiates one from another? So here's a question for you to explore your table for a little bit. Um, two things. First, write it down and then talk about it, okay? What specific cultures do you need to understand most and why? So on that little sheet where there's some empty space for you, CQ kind of reflection page, take a moment to write down a culture that you might need to understand most. All right, my friends, we're going to jump to CQ strategy now. Uh, and here is why. Uh, I mentioned to you that a lot of time is spent with CQ knowledge. And this is really like the turning point of our time together because often we leave these next two elements out. Strategy and action. Strategy is your ability to be aware, plan, and check when you are in spaces, again, that are characterized by cultural difference. Your planning, your awareness, and your checking. So what would it look like for you, perhaps, to be planned in your cross-cultural engagements that are coming up? What would it look like for you to be intentional about paying attention to how things are going? Like maybe not being so focused on your own expression of who you are and what you want to be, but you're paying attention to how it's being reacted to if you're hosting a church party. Right? And then what does it look like to check, right? to have conversations, to find out how you are being received, and if you're accomplishing perhaps the goals that you endeavored into. It's getting heavy. It's a perfect point of transition. I'm going to let you see a little clip. And I want you to be paying attention to perhaps how CQ strategy may have been helpful for the parties in this clip. Hi. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. Mm -hmm. San Diego. You speak English there. Oh, uh, uh, <clears throat> where are you? Wrong. Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. Before that. <laughs> well, my great. I knew it. I was like, they're Japanese or Korean. But. Amazing. 
Hans <laughs> <laughs> There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place in my car. I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, no, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, i uh, regular American. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well. Fish and chips are amazing. <laughs> weird. Really? Weird? Must be a Korean thing. The joggers. At your table. Let this guide your discussion for the next couple of minutes. What suggestions would you have for the joggers if they were more mindful, generally, of cultural intelligence, but more specifically, CQ strategy? See you in a couple of minutes. someone else perhaps has 
done wrong uh, or ways in which they've learned lessons. But the transition now is for us to take a look at ourselves. And so what I want you to do is take a moment, again, to pin for yourself a moment perhaps where you connected with someone with a different background from yourself and what you learned from them. And the experience that you had with someone who was different from yourself and what you learned from them. Take about a minute and a half in silence, reflect and think for yourself, and then we'll have a bit of time to reflect within your group. If I can give you a little bit of uh, nerdy stuff again, this is what we call um, uh, metacognitive engagement. Is that coming through? Yeah, so metacognition is thinking about thinking. Okay, so this gives you a moment to look back and process what was going on for you in the past that might then create a memory in your brain to when you're in a similar uh, excuse me, situation in the future, you can lean on that learning that you've reflected on in the past and engage in perhaps a better way moving forward. So again, a, a memorable experience with someone different than yourself and what you learned from them. Write it down, and then you can feel free to move into conversation with them.
we're gonna we're gonna come together real quick. Thank you, thank you for sharing. All right, we are gonna continue spending some uh, some time in this CQ strategy space. I don't know how many of you all are football fans and appreciate a legend named Marshawn Lynch, but nonetheless, if you haven't fell in love with him, the one thing I appreciate is the fact that Marshawn would say, I'm about that action, boss. So he didn't do a whole lot of talking, but he produced a whole lot on the field and in his community, if you pay attention to some of the efforts that he's made right, to give back to the places that he came from in California. But Marshawn says I'm about that action. So we just thought backwards a little bit, right? Thinking about our thinking, and now maybe we can do it in a forward direction by asking this question of ourselves in just a second. Let me give you some tips real quick, actually. I don't want to skip past your checklist, right? How do we do this? Developing your CQ strategy? A couple quick things. Becoming more aware. And if you're paying attention to what we're doing with our time together, every one of these factors, we are taking a minute to become aware of the capacities and then try and develop them, right? That's the nature of our time together today. This uh, personal window is something that's quite intriguing, right? So for our time together, what I'm attempting to do is give you a concept and then pause and open myself to help perhaps explore an idea from my own personal window. And as we cross cultures, it's actually important to pay attention to how much we are or are not sharing, right? To be frank, there's times where I just need to shut up and let you do your thing. And on the flip side, there's opportunities where it is helpful for me to share a bit of my story and my reflections to help facilitate your own. So knowing when and when not to open your personal window is really important. And the next thing to do is to continue to journal, right? This is reflective work. If we are going to continue to improve, we need some style or way of functioning that helps us capture what we've gone through. So as soon as I am done tonight, what will happen is my colleagues who help pull this together, we're probably gonna grab a brew and talk about what we experienced together. And then I will go home and write perhaps about the jokes that landed or didn't land in Western Michigan, right? So this is the nature of reflection. Journaling is a really important practice that can help you develop your CG strategy. But you can also question your adaptations, plan your cross-cultural interactions, and then check whether your assumptions and your plans were appropriate. There's your CQ strategy. Development in a nutshell. But here's another point of reflection for you all at your table. I would appreciate you reflecting together about an upcoming multicultural engagement or situation that could benefit from some additional planning by you. An upcoming engagement that could benefit from some additional planning by you. Perhaps mindful of the cultural differences that might exist. Mind you that culture is a shared set of ideas, beliefs, behaviors, and assumptions that differentiate one from another. So I had to be intentional about choosing to go to Lulu and get my wife an outfit and also be ready for her critique because it costs so much money. But I don't care, I got that for her because I wanted to show her she was on my mind while I was in this space and I wanted to be comfortable and so I found some stuff that could accomplish that goal. But she already saw that the credit card swipe went through and so I'm ready when I get home, right? to deal with even the potential of it not fitting because, you know, we make mistakes. So, what could you be planning for a multicultural encounter that could benefit from some additional planning by you? Take some time to reflect and then talk about that at your table.
There's speech acts, which would involve, as we maybe leaned into in our cultural values, would be direct or indirect communication. Right? When does one choose to be direct in their communication and perhaps indirect? I don't know how many of you have uh, staff or teams that you work with, or maybe children, right? Um, but I am learning more and more that I do not talk to everybody in the same way because it will not produce the same results. I have some folks on staff that I can tell directly exactly what I need them to do and why and how, and they will go and make that happen. I got other people, if I tell them exactly what I think they should do and why and how, they will shut down and probably do the opposite. All right? So speech X is about how you choose to deliver a message, mindful of the people and the persons with whom you're working and the goals that you are hoping to achieve. Speech X. The next piece is looking at verbal communication. So this would simply be your vocal tone, right? Or the ways in which you vary your pace, or the times in which you put an accent on a word to help make a connection perhaps with a community or someone who speaks a language that is unfamiliar to them. How might you provide an entry point? by using an accent when appropriate. 
Some people like to call this code switching. Right? I teased in church that when Ben and I talk on the phone, our wives know that we are talking to each other. Because the rate of speech, the words that we use, right, the tonality of our vocalization, they differ because we're speaking to different people. When I'm on a chapel stage, I speak a little different than when I'm in a conference or a presentation space, right? It's important to understand when, where, and why you make those adaptations, and perhaps when you don't. And then lastly, it's nonverbal communication. So more often than not, right, this is about eye contact, body language, how we position ourselves even in conversation with someone. Like, for some people, to have a conversation this close is really uncomfortable. You want anything to bring me in? I don't know if this is comfortable or uncomfortable for you, but I'm good. you're good? My life's very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> so, right, this is really important. For some of us, that proximity is lovely. It's warm and it's welcoming. For others, sorry about that. Um, it's like, get away from me, right? Get close. close. So your, your body language and your communication with your physical person matters, right? I'll find some way to share this with Ben so that you all can see it. Um, but there's a few things that you can be doing to try to explore how you maybe should or shouldn't adapt. And there's four questions that you can be asking. One of them is, is it a tight or loose culture? Really quickly, tight culture means uh, you do what people do, and if you do not do what they do, then you'll be in trouble. That makes sense? Tight culture, like, like don't mess up. A loose culture is like, ah, oh, we don't care, do your thing, you'll be fine. Right? Tight versus loose culture. Ask that question. Next, how can you best express your intentions? How can you best express your intentions? Next, are you compromising the organization, the congregation, the denomination, or even yourself? Right? Knowing what values you will and won't give up on. Next, will retaining the differences actually make you stronger? And we don't need to jump too far into scripture, but this is, I think, the value of the body. Right? And you can say your foot, I don't need you. Some parts are to be protected, others can be out in the open, right? There are times where you maybe should assimilate, and other times when you perhaps should not. Those four questions are really helpful. Here's how you can develop your CQ action. Know the taboos in a community. Practice, right? So we do a little indirect, direct communication, right? You can try these things on for size from time to time in an appropriate space to help warm you up, help you improve before it's like a threatening environment where if you mess up, there could be a problem. And then imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. But lastly, the reason it's highlighted is because it's really important to be yourself. So a uh, quick example. Uh, <laughs> there's people, perhaps, we would call on the margins who know if you are faking the funk, right? If your motivation is not clear and you are not being yourself, even though you're trying to stretch and you know, make the world a better place, it's really easy to pick up on that if you are coming from a space where it's critical for you to understand people's intentions, right? So for me, I am quite entertained with locking doors. My wife thinks they need to happen all the time. But then I land in Northwest Iowa when people leave, uh, where people leave their doors unlocked all the time. And I was a little confused because we're out in this agrarian culture that's quite rural, and uh, there's a few lesser threats. Like, people don't steal cars because we know whose car is whose, and if someone else is driving it, we can find out and hold someone accountable, right? My wife's like, locking doors, locking doors. But for me at home, I would never imagine in Kansas City or in Minneapolis-St. Paul, never imagine leaving my door unlocked. But for me, that's an assessment of the space in which I'm, I'm operating in, right? So there's cues that I pick up on that help me understand, is it time for me to lock my door or we're here? You can think about that for yourself. But for me, being myself means being aware of my surroundings and not having to worry in ways that, like, it's a closed culture where I have to do the same thing all the time, no matter where I am. But at the same time, there are some values for me, like loving my neighbor, 
that I will never let go of, which means a whole slew of challenging things, like what does it mean to have LGBTQ members a part of one's congregation? Can they serve in leadership or not? What are the implications for service and lead? Right? So there's some things for me that are foundational that I will never let go of, regardless of where I am. I'm going to give you a, a, a moment. We're going to slow it down real quick. Don't go yet. Um, a, a moment to observe this interaction, though. Uh, and I want you to be paying attention to the parties that are involved and perhaps what are both the challenges and opportunities that are being presented across these differences. So here's the scene. There um, is a group of folks that will be on one side of the table, and they are giving a presentation, and a group on the other side of the table who is receiving a presentation. And as you might imagine, things will not go smoothly, but I want you to pay attention perhaps to why, and then we'll talk about that in your table. Some were able to see and others not, if there's some explanation needed, uh, the people at your table can provide that. But essentially we had marketers and engineers meeting. The marketers thought it was a presentation, the engineers thought it was a brainstorming session. Right? Um, and then conflict emerges, the marketers who brought their beautiful presentation uh, and passed it off were a bit disappointed and uh, surprised in that the uh, engineering team was scribbling on their presentation materials, right? And then at the end of the day, they were trying to launch a product, and the product was at a standstill as a result of that meeting, right? So, uh, talking to your tables about these questions. One, what helps explain the uh, behavioral differences between the engineers and the marketers? Perhaps cultural biases, uh, or implicit biases and cultural value differences? And then secondly, how does the cultural background of an audience influence the way you prepare? Start with number one, and we'll revisit number two together.
trying to, my wife Liz, and I'm Jerry, trying to figure out where, what church community we fit in in Holland and uh, not wanting to feel guilty about reducing ourselves to the simplest outside thing, right? Well, we're a white couple that went to hope in the early 2000s, and we want to be part of the first community. But we can't just sit there and wait mm -hmm. for us to feel validated by being the first community. Mm -hmm. right? We really have to have a posture of just being ourselves or who we are as well, and not feel maybe guilty about who we are, but also not feel like we need to try it all the time. Thank you. Uh, say that line that you told me earlier, the belonging, and that you have this really beautiful line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all, I'm going I'm to get us there real fast. Are y'all ready? <laughs> we're getting ready to wrap this up. So here's a question for you related to the CQ actions. What's one behavior that you could adapt when interacting with others? I will never get that close to you again. OK? That's a behavior. That, so I'm just, yeah, teasing, right? But what is the behavior, perhaps, that uh, is normal for you that perhaps you should or could be adapting when interacting with others? Here's a big turning point, y'all, as we start to wrap this up. Um, diversity in and of itself does not yield the benefits that we simply imagine are going to happen naturally. The research actually is showing more and more that when you throw a bunch of diverse people together, there's a state of what we might call gridlock, which you may have observed in the pause of that product moving forward in the example video. Diverse groups don't simply work well together in and of themselves. There are ways that it can. We have Gordon Allport who gives us this contact theory framework that suggests uh, you need a, a shared goal and equal status, and you need to ensure that people um, are in personal relationships and that leadership or authority are helping move these ideas forward and supporting it. But diversity in and of itself does not yield a lot of the beautiful results that we get. But to find more and more that as cultural intelligence levels are increased, then the value and the beauty of diverse communities and teams and congregations can be embodied. And it'll get to this idea that for me, what I've tried to land on at the end of the day is doing something pretty simple. And it's about BB. So this is like my, my summary of what this word means in terms of being a multicultural church in the 21st century, is that we need to build belonging and dignify difference, and in so doing, glorify God. Build belonging and dignify difference, in so doing, glorify God. That's for me the landing point for all of the work that I get to do as Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Bethel University and St. Paul, where again, the world's gaze is on this part of the world, but it's like the civil rights hotspot of our times. What does it look like in that space to build belonging and dignify difference to the glory of God? And I hope as you walk away, you are recognizing that one, uh, you are leaning in by choosing to show up and be in this space to develop your capacities. That's a good thing. And I want to encourage you to do this as you move forward. Recognizing, and I would consider you all to be leaders in whatever right you might consider yourself to be such, is think about aligning your expectations and understanding your CQ drive, and then mapping your cultural value differences, right? As you're working with a team, what does it look like actually to understand the different cultural values that exist with your people, be it your worship team, and your children's ministry, and your outreach coordinators, and et cetera, right? The next creating means for communication. How do y'all want to talk to each other? That's a strategic decision, right? Tapping into your CQ strategy, and then lastly, draw the diversity of your team to be able to benefit from what they all have to offer. And again, we can talk theology, but that's what I think the value of the body really is about. I do hope you get to ask yourself this question as well, is what does CQ look like in real life for you, in your personal life? We giggled about my wife and my communication styles, right? Um, but then what does it mean for you as a professional, right? And then similarly, in your church and within your faith, 
what does CQ speak to you when you're in, I guess, a mindful reflection of each of those? We won't walk through each of these, y'all, but this is like the theological foundation for why I suggest building belonging, dignifying the difference to the glory of God. Building belonging is about image bearing, dignifying difference is about what we know will be true in the end, and glorifying God, when Jesus put it quite simply for us, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I think that's where we should land at the end of the day. Ben, I think we should have a little Q&A, man. We got about 15-ish minutes. Um, I would love to just open the floor for any questions, pushback, um, wisdom that you all have to share. The floor is wide open, but thank you for uh, diving in. And I would love to hear whatever questions and ideas are bubbling up in your brain. shouldn't be probably the first thing that you ask them if you don't know them, right? <laughs> hey, brown person, you know, I don't know you, I don't know your name, what do you want to be called? You know, but like, as you know this person, I'd be happy to say, hey, like, I, I prefer a Chicano because this is why, you know, like, my grandfather, um, one time Latino was brought up and he got really mad. He was like, mijo, like, this is your land, this is where you're from, you're not Latino, you're not from Latin America, like, you're from here, this is our land, you know? And so like, I can tell you long stories about that. Quick answer, ask somebody who wants to know. Which is relationship, right? Like that's what we're doing here. We're, we're getting to know each other. And in the CQ framework, that's about planning awareness and checking. CQ strategy. <laughs> there it is, there it is. <laughs> Good question. What else, yo? Anybody who's done that well, thought it worked out, experiences in the room, how do you do that? Get out of your own spaces. Get out of your own spaces. Yes, say more. Well, if you're not having that in your spaces, then in spaces that are, for example, a church or a or spaces where, like, Um, 
uh, last year, Stephanie Soderstrom is, was the leader of our life group, um, and then we moved on. Uh, and um, <laughs> we, we multiplied. We multiplied. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say split, and people are like, ah, you know. Um, but she had, we listened to a podcast um, by Brene Brown, and one of the things that was fascinating about this that we're, we, were, we talked about was oftentimes we aren't intentional about the, the places and spaces that we already occupy because we're afraid of vulnerability. Brene Brown, vulnerability, you know, Brene Brown, you know, vulnerability is a big thing for her. But it's because it, I've been interested in this, like, love, we can love our neighbor, we can, but, but loving even in today's context and culture can be from a distance. It's a completely different thing to embrace our neighbor. So yeah, like maybe at the school drop-off or at our work or in our neighborhood, we have people who are different than us, but, but, and we can say we love them, but what does it look like for us to actually embrace them? And I think the trick is there's no quick fix. And it's a life, like it, it's really a, a, a lifestyle where we're embracing them and they're embracing us, realizing that we both have gifts that we can um, benefit from, whether it be um, learning how to cook, <laughs> like, you know, or, or learning how to sew, or learning how to cut my lawn, or uh, learning uh, about culture and what you want to be called Chicano, Latin, Latinx, you know. Uh, Hispanic, you know, all those things. So how do we, are, how, how do we be aware of spaces and people that we are already in contact with and learn how to embrace them? Because it's around, right? Holland, Michigan is already 25% um, Latino, uh, about five to 10% black, and a, a growing Asian population. You know, like in my neighborhood alone, we probably embody all that, like my block, I mean. Um, and I would imagine maybe your uh, neighborhood too. So you hear that 25%, that's one in four in Holland, friends. One in four. And as that number was presented today, I started to think about my friend group. And I'm mixed. And yes, I say mixed. I identify as mixed. You might have to ask other people who are biracial if mixed is okay with them. They might say no. They might say yes. It's a personal preference. And you can ask me what I am. I'm not bothered by that. I love that. I'd love to tell you about my friends. But I have to ask myself, even looking at my friend group, it's very Listen, hard. Oh. Sorry, Kate. It's, it, I like it. Who, who are we rubbing shoulders with where I'm looking at 25% of my friends, Hispanic or Latino? Because it's very easy for me to gravitate to other people who are biracial, other people who are black, even other women. And so I'm, I'm asking that of myself. And I say that in a vulnerable space as a biracial woman. So even as we reflect on this space, right? What does it look like to have one in four present? But not just present, perhaps even in leadership. And not just in leadership, like important to the life and the functions, the operations, if you will, not just the optics of the organizations, the churches, the communities that we are part of. Michelle. And I think the important piece is, if I can be honest with you guys, sometimes it's like, well, Pastor Ben will do it. You know? Like, you know, he'll bring them all, you know? But I think as we're in conversation and relationship, if this is our church, which you are here because you say that this is really important. You care about this. You care about the boulevard. You care about, more importantly, the kingdom of God and people discovering God's love with their neighbor. Like this is a, a, a communal, um, uh, a communal value that we're all living in imperfectly. But that's where grace comes in. But I think it's important for us to not just deflect and say, "Well, it's that person's job over there," or it's that group's job over there. But if we are believers in Jesus and, and say that we are the body and we want to include all people, like how do, how do we move from deflection to embracing and saying, this is part of my responsibility as a follower of Jesus who says that Boulevard Church is their home church and who says Holland, Michigan is their mission field. And, you know, oftentimes I think we can say, well, man, even mission field, like that's colonialistic, right? Like there's this concept where, you know, Many, many hundreds of years ago, uh, the Europeans came over and 
made the Native Americans do all these things and worship and pray and sing and all these other things. Um, so I think sometimes we outthink and outsmart ourselves in just doing, I think what we all want to do is belong in relationship because we're just thinking, like, am I saying the right thing? And that's where I think the BBDDGG is really helpful. What is that again? Yeah. Build belonging, dignify a difference to the glory of God. I think that dignifying difference piece is so important to understand who we are in Christ. We understand who we are in Christ, and because of that, we are dignified. But because of that, we can build relationships with people who are different than us with the confidence that they, too, represent and embody the image bearingness of God just as much as I do. Not more than, not less than, but just as much. And just because maybe I got a little bit more money in my bank account or just because I got you know, less degrees than the other person or just because I have less social capital or whatever it might be, we are all image bearers of God. And when we are dignifying our differences, that's when I think, honestly, revival starts to happen, you know, because like, that's why we're doing this, right? Something to add to that too, I think to kind of think about your question a little bit and how this all ties in. I think getting to that dignifying difference also involves the hard work of checking our own personal biases. Um, so like asking ourselves, why is it so hard for me? Why do I get this feeling of discomfort in reaching out to someone who's different than me as opposed to someone who looks like me? And having those Part, it's not brutal, but having those conversations with yourself, checking your biases, checking, I guess, checking in with yourself when you have those discomfort feelings, and then even like asking the Lord for help, like, I want to get better at this, I want to do more of this, and then that can help spur you on to do that. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that's good. You just like put a bow on CQ motivation or drive, right? That's what it's all about. Yeah. Intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, and then your sense of self confidence and self efficacy, right? So, so um, we're going to wrap this up. And if you have kids being watched at Boulevard Church, they would uh, appreciate you. Uh, going over there and picking them up. Uh, <laughs> that's me saying, y'all yeah, gonna go. Uh, but before uh, we do, before we uh, this, get dismissed, friends, next steps. If you are not in the life group, I would invite you to consider joining us tomorrow night. Pastor Kate and I, we're, we're gonna cook some, cook some food, we're gonna have some conversation. That is how I believe we can start to embody this lifestyle of difference. Um, and so I would encourage you to really take those next steps with us. Last thing, Don, would you pray for us as we embark on this eight-week journey of having some intentional conversation on this? And thank you, bro, for like coming out here and being away from your new job and your family. And just we're super grateful for you. So everybody around the clock. Around. All right, so a quick preface, this prayer will be stemming from a bit of my reformed tradition engagement at Northwestern, and I hope that you kind of catch the movements of the theater, right, of this narrative that's been scripted from us, or for us, from Genesis to Revelation. So pray for me, please, friends. Lord, we thank you for who you are and the great acts that you have prescribed for us and the ways in which we can engage in your redemptive work in the world. We thank you for creation, we thank you for the fall, and we thank you for redemption, and we thank you for reconciliation. We ask that you encourage and embed the idea of embracing the diversity of your creation in our lives. We ask that you encourage us to also lament, cry out to you for help for the brokenness that is all of us. We ask that you help us recognize our role in participating in your redemptive work in the world, where all things are being reconciled back to right relationship with you. And finally, Lord, we ask that you continue to help us find ways to embody shalom. 
where the beauty of all of creation and right relationship with you is becoming more present in the already and the not yet. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are doing and will do forever. We love you. We ask that you continue to help us love each other and also love ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, hold on, peeps. If everybody's nice, so nice, we're going to ask some help. So, um, as you leave today, if you could take your glasses back to the bar if you ordered a beverage, and if you could make sure that the tables